Greetings and welcome. Today is a topic I generally never really had the time to talk about, and I may be jumping the gun a bit here, but I still feel that this is a valid topic as ever, and that is Beastgrave and rotation. Today I'll be going over the Beastgrave season of Warhammer Underworlds, from the effects it had on the game and how its rotation will affect Warhammer Underworlds as a whole. Now before I go on, please remember to like and subscribe, as well as to comment as what you thought of today's video, and well, how you feel Beastgrave rotating will affect the game. Will you miss it? Will you even care? Just let me know down below. And I've also downed this as an article if you're interested, which you can find in the episode description too. So what is rotation? Rotation is the effect introduced at the start of the Beastgrave season by Games Workshop. What Rotation does is cycle out the Universal cards from the next oldest season at the start of a new season for Warhammer Underworlds. For example, when Beastgrave started, Shadespire Universal cards were rotated out, but Night Vault Universal cards were still legal for competitive play. With the start of Diachasm, Night Vault Universal cards were rotated out of play, but Beastgrave Universal cards were still available for use. This is expected to continue whenever we get a Season 5 for Warhammer Underworlds. Rotation is also only for the main competitive formats, so it has no effect on casual play and well, relic play. Rotation was implemented to minimise card bloat and broken combinations for competitive play. It cycles out older Universal cards, but keeps faction cards and warbands from older seasons legal. If we didn't have rotation, the current card pool would be close to 2,000 cards, instead of around a th what about 1,000 we have at the moment. This does make Warhammer Underworlds sort of detrimental to casual players, as they will eventually have their collections unusable in competitive play for a championship format, unless they keep buying new product. While this really isn't great for casual players, especially as Relic format is a mess, it does help to keep the competitive side of the game healthy and relatively balanced. For example, could you imagine the chaos if cards like Ready for Action still saw play? The Forsaken and Restricted list would be colossal in size and scope. Note, I do really feel for people who have been unable to play and use their cards since lockdown started, as that is around the time just after the Wormspat and Hrothgorn's Mantrappers dropped, namely with Morgwave's Blade Coven and Morgok's Crushers. If we get a new season in the old usual slot of September, it really does suck sadly, as there's just going to be a bunch of people who are unable to use stuff they bought physically. In addition, this applies to game boards too. Love it or hate it, rotation has wide-reaching effects. While losing boards does suck, it does help to keep board collections down and reduce players flipping through 10 plus double-sided game boards. Plus, rotation means we saw the loss of the Molten Shard Pit, and that should forever be always celebrated. For my Beastgrave overview, Beastgrave as a whole shook the foundations of Warhammer Underworlds. Quite quickly from the start, with the launch of the Grimwatch Warband expansion, the game saw the power of Surge objectives, namely Surge Hold Objective objectives, and they quickly rose to prominence. The Hold Objective playstyle didn't just rise to power, it became the dominant playstyle. It knocked everyone away while aggro fell to the weakest it has ever been in the history of Warhammer Underworlds. Beastgrave Warbands also affected the game a lot. The core set Warbands were seemingly quite balanced when it came to power levels, but Warbands like the Grimwatch, Ripper's Snarlfangs, Hrothgorn's Man Trappers, and Morgok's Crushers combined amazing stats, rules, and abilities with borderline broken power cards and objectives. Even today, these warbands still rocket out well in Diachasm. 
these warbands were so powerful that Games Workshop even begun restricting faction cards to try and tone them down. Special mention goes to Lady Harrow's Mournflight, who while not being part of the Beastgrave season, were still released in it, and so also rocked the game's balance. It can be argued that Games Workshop really did push the power of warbands and faction cards, but probably by too big a margin. The Grimwatch had amazing inspired fighters with crazy strong surge objectives and power cards, making them the scariest hold objective warband to play against until they got faction restricted cards. Ripper's Snarlfangs have potentially the best aggro output thanks to their Snarlfangs Jaws reaction attack, along with strong faction cards. Hrothgorn's Man Trappers showed the power of big boys again and had an obnoxious turtle control build that took faction restrictions to tone down. Then you have Morgok's Crushers, who combine all being 5 wounds with great damage output and crazy damage negation cards while also having easy surge objectives too. In comparison, the Diachasm Warbounds are strong, but not on a level that the Beastgrave Warbounds are. So at least we can see Games Workshop did see the error of their ways. Although Drepper's Wraith Creepers are an obnoxiously broken blip in an otherwise very balanced fourth season. The third season of Warhammer Underworlds started the trend of counter and token mechanics, which has taken hold with Diachasm. While not broken or obnoxious, the counter and token mechanics in Beastgrave just felt odd. Sadly, their evolution in Diachasm wasn't good either. Along with faction restricted cards, Beastgrave required mass Nightvolt Universal card restrictions to keep Warhammer Underworlds balanced. Although the lack of good and reliable end phase objectives in Beastgrave did see cards like Fired Up become unrestricted in a weird twist of fate. Then there is Arena Mortis. This multiplayer only game mode not only added new rules and updated faction cards for the Sepulchral Guard, it also added a bunch of broken upgrades that have all been pretty much restricted. While those upgrades functioned fine in games of Arena Mortis, they were broken in the main Warhammer Underworlds game and continued the tradition of Power Unbound with an after season expansion adding a bunch of broken cards to the main game. Beastgrave wasn't all bad though. The game grew a lot competitively, with a lot of tournaments, at least in the UK, regularly attracting large crowds. Pretty much all UK Grand Clashes attracted 100 plus players. Not only that, but the new Forsaken and Restricted lists did help balance the game when they dropped, even if far updates were more sporadic than preferred. There was also the announcement of the Warhammer Underworlds Masters for 2020 at Nova, but I'm trying to keep this bit positive. Let's just say, raffling off invites for your premier competitive end of year event probably wasn't the best of ideas. With that brief history covered, I'll now go over my favourite part, the Beastgrave cards, which will have the biggest impact on the game once rotated. Some players will miss these, others can't wait to see them go. Let me know in the comments with your thoughts. For objectives, Gathered Momentum is probably going to be missed the most. This surge, which should have been restricted a long time ago and still hasn't, is too easy to score and is pretty much unstoppable by your opponent. Score it as an aggro player or even just off of scoring more surge objectives. Personally, I can't wait to see this objective disappear. Temporary Victory and Hidden Purpose. These surges had to be mentioned as they caused the biggest impact to Warhammer Underworlds. Score immediately for holding three or two objectives for two or one glory respectively. Even while restricted, they're still too good. Imagine seeing someone miss an attack and then the opponent scores both of these objectives. It was just soul destroying. Swift Capture is probably the best designed Surge Hold objective card. It will really be sad to see it go. 
one glory for holding at least one objective in each player's territory, forced engagement, and made it still risky to score, as you could potentially be sacrificing a friendly fighter to get that glory. Bold Conquest from the Beastgrave Gift Pack is a surge and duel objective, which just needs your leader to charge onto an objective. This is great for any leaders with range 2 or 3 attack actions like the Briar Queen, and was super reliable for aggro players, seeing as you just needed to charge and not make a successful attack. Bold Conquest still has risks, but it is an easy and reliable surge objective that aggro players will miss. Feed the Beastgrave is 5 glory for having no objectives on the battlefield. It is currently the main reason why flip decks are so obnoxious due to all the flip tech in Diachasm. Will flip decks even be relevant anymore with that no 5 glory potential post rotation? Coveted Spoils is 3 glory for having all objectives held. Was super relevant in Beastgrave due to the prominence of hold objective play, but has seen little play with Diachasm although it has tied into Feed the Beastgrave decks. Still, it will be a shame to see it go, as Coveted Spoils is still a fairly easy free glory objective, as you and your opponent can score it for you. Set the Tempo, Push the Tempo is a free glory dual objective. You score for scoring 6 or more objectives, with 2 of each being at least 2 hybrids and 2 dual objectives. While lacking in Beastgrave, this objective has seen much more play in Diachasm due to the increase in good hybrid and dual objectives. It is a key objective for Headcracker's Mad Mob decks too, who will dearly miss the loss of such a reliable Free Glory end phase card. Show of Force, even while restricted, is still really good. You can score it immediately for either having a friendly fighter with 3 or more upgrades, or having 3 or more fighters in enemy territory. Once again, another aggro stable but also for most decks due to the upgrade stacking condition. Just another consistent surge objective that will be lost to the spin of rotation. Team Effort is a staple end phase objective for any 3 to 4 fighter warbands. It is a dual objective that you score for having 2 or more friendly fighters surviving and each of them has been activated. Beastgrave and Diachasm struggle heavily in decent end phase objectives. Losing team effort hits a lot of warbands, irrespective of their playstyles. Diakazo warbands are especially worried that the season has 5 warbands with 4 fighters. Uncontested is a dual objective and the bane of aggro players. It's free glory if you hold 2 or more objectives and no enemy fighters hold objectives. With mass push cards, it makes uncontested incredibly consistent, even today. Hold objective players will deeply miss this card. Aggro and control players will rejoice. Cover Ground, while not technically being a Beastgrave card, was released in the gift pack and thus will rotate. Even restricting the surge objective has done little to curtail its power. Score for moving 6 or more hexes in any direction, even a circle. Losing it will hurt the speed package along with gathered momentum. Wing Death will likely take its place but Cover Ground probably should have never been reprinted in the first place. For Gambits, Distraction and Nightmare in the Shadows, Pusher Fighter 1 Hex, probably the biggest losses for Gambits with Rotation. While they sort of kept hold objective players in check, Warband with Faction Distraction cards abused these to death. I still think a single Distraction card is healthy, but two have been problematic. With both gone, however, the severely limited Hypnotic Buzz or Center of Attention will try and fill the void. Buried Instinct is a reaction that gives your fighter a guard token when attacked. Amazing Reaction Window? Check. Free Surprise, G Free surprise Guard? Check. I'm surprised it never got restricted. Just such an amazing card thanks to the power of guard. Multiple defense fighter warbands will dearly miss its loss. Collapse, while not as prominent as it was when Night Vault Universal cards were still in play, allowed mass reliable damage for fighters hugging edge hexes. Collapse rotating kinda pretty much kills ping damage decks. Wormspat, I'm so sorry. The draw cards. Frenzied Search, Quick Search, and a Natural Truce. Two of these cards have been restricted. Why? I think Warhammer Underworlds generally needs one draw card per season. Having three with such good and easy draw effects is insane. 
players regularly ended action phase 2 with their entire decks drawn out. Who will miss their loss the most? Players who rely on their cards to win games. Can't wait to see these draw cards disappear. Mischievous Spirits, the gambit that ruins the end phase for hold objective players. While it got restricted a little too late, seeing it go completely as nice. It was too strong for aggro players and too disruptive against hold objective players. Rebound. I mean, it was already dead being restricted, but now it will completely go. Forever. The rage it produced on reveal was beyond compare, as it almost killed aggro in Beastgrave, where it was already near death. Spectral Wings. It's weird. Plus two move is great, but Diachasm is so full of movement cards that Spectral Wings will go from being a big loss to slightly missed. Hurts the speed package of cards overall, but I think its loss is probably for the better. Aggro players will miss being Sonic on all their main fighters. Gotta go fast. For upgrades, the Amber Bone weapons are attack action upgrades that all have the main effect of discarding them on kill to gain one glory with sometimes other additional effects. These upgrades, mainly due to the fact that their damage could be modified, allowed for explosive glory gain in many decks. They were commonly used by both hold objective and aggro players. Their loss may be a sad one, but it will open up the usage of more varied attack action upgrades. Cryptic Companion, ah, uh, so broken, makes you a quarry and you gain one glory at the end of each action phase while holding an objective. While I loved abusing it, Cryptic Companion going helps Warhammer Underworld's balance as a whole. The Lost Pages were only really useful because of the Scattered Tome. These Lost Page upgrades could only be equipped to Wizards, and while they had varying effects, you mainly took them for the Scattered Tome which gave you one glory for each Lost Page upgrade you had equipped. Never really game breaking as Cataphrane Tomes, but just helped reinforce Turtle Control builds like with the Crimson Court. Trophy Belt is the last of the universal extra glory on kill upgrades. While not as powerful as Tome of Offerings, it's still another loss which Hunter aggro players will miss, especially Ripper's Snellfangs and Hrothgorn's Mantrappers players. Strength of Terror, the best plus one dice upgrade we've seen in Warhammer Underworlds. Only works on range one and two attack actions as well as making you a quarry. Even while restricted, it's still taken. Only range free fighters miss out on it. At least with Strength of Terragon, we don't have to worry about stuff like free smash on Molog and so on. Survival Instincts and Tight Defense, both amazing upgrades that basically put you on permanent guard. Both restricted too. Thankfully, we can see with Diagasm that Games Workshop has learned how powerful it can be to give any fighter permanent guard. Sting of the Urgrub, an Urgrub aspect card that grants plus one strength to range one attack actions and changes your equipped fighter into the avatar of the Urgrub if they have all three Urgrub aspect cards. Even restricted, it is still a strong upgrade. While I'll miss it, Sting of the Urgrub going helps tone down the power and ease of access aggro has when it comes to extra damage thanks to Diachasm. The Mortis relics all had varying effects of spending glory to either push fighters or draw cards, as reactions. In theory they are balanced, but glory is gained so fast and easily since Beastgrave that their costs never really felt like costs at all. They should have stayed in Arena Mortis only, and are now all restricted. Don't even forget that they all had passive buffs for stacking Mortis relics too. Crazy! Vision of Glory Reaction to spend a glory after an activation to remove a charge token and then discard the upgrade. So, so broken. Oddly, it should have had a free glory cost. Everyone should be glad to see this go. Blocked reaction windows and allowed powerful fighters to keep charging such as Molog, Ripper, Morgok, and so on. Now for my honourable mentions. While I did cover a lot of cards, these are just specific mentions for cards that particular warbands and or playstyles will miss. Basically not that meta shattering, but enough to kill already weak or low powered builds. Hunting Bolt, you amazingly balanced gambits spell you, ping damage that can do 2 damage against a hunter or quarry. 
It will be missed by magic. It will be missed by magic users as it is basically their only good ping spell across both Beastgrave and Diachasm. Just sucks if you like playing magic. Poison gambits, the good ones, so only just lead bone dust, rock snake toxin, and spine toad toxin. Now these were some good and interesting gambits, but poison gambits never really took off until Elethane Soul Raid. Honestly, abuse the poison cards with the spine fin while you still can. The future looks incredibly rough for the Idenf Warband once those poison gambits rotate. Combo now. This mechanic allowed you to attack with a special reaction attack action upgrade if the first attack made had the combo keyword. We barely saw any of this in Beastgrave, but saw much more in Arena Mortis. As they all rotate, only a single warband will really miss it. More Grace Blade Coven. They're currently not in a great spot, but still have a fun combo build that works now and again. With all the good combo stuff going, they're just gonna keep tumbling down, tumbling down, tumbling down. Get into Robot Shinji. Should you prepare for rotation? So a common thing I see and get asked is should you prepare for rotation? As in, should you start playing with decks that don't use any Beast Grave cards or cards from a season that is about to be rotated out? While I get the theory behind that, to basically get a head start and practice for the future, it won't really make much difference at all and I always advise against it. Unless you're a playtester, you don't really know what the future rules and cards for the next season will bring and core rules you thought safe could potentially change in a big way. For example, Night Vault had no surge limit while Beastgrave introduced a 6 surge limit to your objective deck. Diachasm introduced a rules change for diagonal board configuration changing from a 3 hex gap minimum to a 4 hex gap. Small changes like that have big ripples on Warhammer Underworlds and you can't really anticipate alterations like those. My advice is to just enjoy what you have now. Remember it just has a finite lifespan, but have fun anyway. Sure rotation will change everything, but then you get to enjoy trying to adapt along with the whole Warhammer Underworlds community for the new season. Where will the meta shift? With each season of Warhammer Underworlds, you can identify a dominant gameplay style. For example, Shadespy was basically aggro, Night Vault control, Beastgrave hold objectives, and Diachasm was back to aggro. For prediction of where the meta will shift, who knows? As linked back to if you should prepare for rotation, we can't really predict where the meta will shift with the loss of Beastgrave universal cards on rotation. While aggro loses some key cards, they have tons of good Diachasm Universal cards to access. Hold objectives take a bigger hit, but the essential card pack keeps their power up. Control, however, takes the biggest hit with the loss of mass draw cards and also lost pages for certain turtle control builds. Unless Diachasm Universal cards get hit more, I can't really see aggro losing power especially with Primacy. My biggest advice is to invest in Beastgrave now. Maximum stonks. By that, I mean buy the powerful Beastgrave warbands now before they rotate as they will become unavailable to buy. Plus, they're super strong even with faction card restrictions. For example, with Morgox Crushers, you can't really nerf them all being 5 wounds each. Or the continual attack action output from Ripper's Snarlfangs. Even then you have Hrothgorn's quarry effect that affects every fighter on the board. With the rotation of Night Vault, we saw new players upset at being unable to buy Molog as Games Workshop refuses to reprint older warbands or do them as a made-to-order service. So my advice is if you're a new player and want to be competitive but don't want to fully invest in Beastgrave, buy the following warbands. The Grimwatch, Ripper's Snarlfangs, Hrothgorn's Mantrappers and Morgox Crushers. Technically you should grab Lady Harrow's Mournflight 2 as they are part of the Champions of Dreadfane set 
but will be rotated as well. Now you could wait for the inaugural start of new season Exodus, where old players try to flog their entire Warhammer Underworlds collections to new players as they leave the game. But the problem with that is you can end up buying more than you bargained for, as people will generally try to sell their entire collections as a whole and not individually. Just buy via Games Workshop or your friendly local gaming store while they're still basically new. For the Beast Grave Rotation Overview, so in conclusion, the rotation of Beast Grave is going to have a huge impact on Warhammer Underworlds. I feel the biggest change will be in the consistency of objective decks. Beast Grave has a lot of easy and powerful surge objectives. Warbounds are going to struggle in the future unless they have really good faction objectives to fall back on. Beast Grave Warbands going out of production will generally mean that they are also less likely to be seen based upon the idea of both new players influxing into the game and are unable to buy them, which is better for the health of Warhammer Underworlds in general, even if that is kind of messed up. Losing so many powerful universal cards should also make the game a little less deadly when being on the receiving end of an aggro player. Hold objectives will miss out on hidden purpose and temporary victory, but that's not really a bad thing. My biggest and only real complaint when it comes to Beast Grave rotation is that it's probably happening at the worst time possible. If a new season does drop in September, there will be people who have been unable to use their physical cards since the drop of the last two Beast Grave Warbands. Then they become unusable. I expect a lot of angry backlash, and to be fair, it's justified. I would have liked Diachasm to be spread over 12 to 18 months instead of the basically six months we got instead. Or maybe even relaxed rotation for a year. I really just feel bad for the players who have been unable to use their physical card collections since June 2020 and have still been buying into the game. To be clear, Games Workshop is in a tight spot. No matter what they do with rotation, people will be upset on either side, so I do feel bad for them on that front. For the closing crit, so that's pretty much it when it comes to Beast Grave rotation. I'm looking forward to it personally, but what about you? What card will you miss? Are you eagerly counting down the days to say goodbye to Beast Grave? Let me know in the comments. Perhaps we can even reminisce about the silly Beast Grave moments and interactions we all experienced. At the end of the day, rotation is coming, so be prepared. Bon voyage, Surge Grave. There's nothing that can stand up to the power of infinite and inevitable rotation. Not even crits.